Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi Rosen, for your very relevant words. Creo que en el mundo académico nada hay peor que el aburrimiento. Sospecho que nadie se ha aburrido en esta hora larga que llevamos trabajando. Tenemos, si la organización no me ha engañado, media hora larga más para poder trabajar. Eh, es el momento, por lo tanto, de la discusión. Es el momento en que cualquiera de ustedes puede dirigirse a la mesa y plantear aquel problema, aquel aspecto que considere conveniente tratar con más detalle. Por favor. Represento a una asociación de amistad judeocristiana de base en Valencia y la pregunta es ¿cuál es el techo de las relaciones judeocristianas? Hay líneas rojas, el techo, ¿hasta dónde se puede llegar en el diálogo judeocristiano? ¿Hay líneas rojas que no se pueden tocar? Do you want me to answer or do you want to take more questions? No. You know, of course, the witticism that if there are two Jews, there are three opinions. So, and it is not a matter of just of Jewish opinions. It is also a matter of people's own subjective context and realities. So for some, there may be red lines, and for others, there are no red lines at all. For me personally, I do not think there is anything that is outside the realm of dialogue and discussion, where we must learn to respect what divides us as well as to celebrate what unites us. And to realize that often that precisely which unites us is what divides us, even terminology. The word Messiah is a good example in that regard, where we don't understand the term in the same way. And therefore, it's important for us to be able to discuss and look and analyze our understandings, both to appreciate the differences as well as that which unites us. There are some of my colleagues who have their red line. This is based upon what I think, personally, is a distorted understanding of Rabbi J.B. Soloveitchik's article that was written in a periodical tr tradition in the early 60s. Incidentally, it was before Nostra Etate, so I think he would have changed his mind. Secondly, there is no reference of the article to Israel, which is strange, almost as if he's still in a pre-sovereign uh, period. But at any rate, there is this rather disingenuous idea that you can distinguish between theological discussion on the one hand and social and political concerns on the other. And this, in my opinion, in my opinion is disingenuous because when two people discuss the weather, they are di two people of faith are discussing the weather, they are discussing theology. So, in my opinion, personally, there are no limits, but I have colleagues who, within the Orthodox community, who will say we can discuss everything but not questions of faith and of belief. Personally, I do not share that. More, I actually think that they limit the richness of the relationship in this particular approach. There are interpreters of Rabbi Soloveitchik who say that the reason he made this distinction was to enable Orthodox rabbis to participate in relations with Christians without feeling that they were the same as Reform rabbis, God forbid. <laughs> and uh, this could be the answer as well, but all of this doesn't matter to me. Uh, I, think that it's, I think that our relationship can only fully progress if we can fully talk to one another about everything that is dear to us and everything that is important to us and respect those particular differences. Muchas gracias. Más preguntas? Uh, no más. Sí, se oye, sí. Uh, primero, muchas gracias a los componentes de la mesa, pero muy especialmente al Rabbi Rosen por su por su, uh, sus ideas intelectualmente brillantes y, sobre todo, por, por su pasión. Yo querría, mmm, yo querría hacer primero un brevísimo testimonio personal para acabar en dos preguntas muy concretas para usted, Rabino. Eh, 
toda mi vida, desde que tengo uso de razón, tengo 65 años, he tenido un profundísimo respeto por el judaísmo y por el pueblo judío. Y a medida que me he ido formando más, leyendo muchas veces el Antiguo Testamento y la Biblia entera uh, y, y conociendo a fondo, no a fondo, pero sí la historia y la historia de Israel en particular, esta, este respeto se ha ido transformando en admiración, por un lado, y en agradecimiento, por otro. ¿no? Yo creo que el pueblo judío es, es, eh, es, tiene tres proezas. En primer lugar, una proeza teológica, es el padre del monoteísmo. En segundo lugar, una, una proeza ética. El código ético alcanzado por los profetas es algo inexistente en la humanidad antes. Y en tercer lugar, un, una proeza histórica de mantener eso durante 2.800 años. 3.800 años, perdón. Eh, y entonces, esto me produce una, una enorme... Yo no las veo solamente como mis hermanos mayores en la fe, sino como mis padres en la fe. Pero no obstante, soy un hijo, soy un hijo maduro. Yo, mis hijos, yo soy padre... Y mis hijos muchas veces me, me, me enriquecen con sus aportaciones. Y aquí es donde llegan mis dos cuestiones, que son dos cuestiones personales muy íntimas, pero que también son dos preguntas para, para usted. La primera, a mí yo no encuentro respuesta. El mundo moderno acusa a Dios de perverso, porque ve el sufrimiento que hay en el mundo y dice, ¿cómo puede un Dios bueno permitir semejante cosa? Y yo personalmente no encuentro más que una respuesta y es el sufrimiento voluntario de Dios en Jesucristo en el que creo y, y, y siendo hijo eh, en la fe del pueblo judío y del judaísmo eh, esta respuesta, no sé si hay una respuesta eh, similar o que pueda aportar algo en, en, el, en el mundo judío, supongo que sí, pero me gustaría conocerla. Y la segunda cuestión es, yo no soy una persona obsesionada con la muerte ni que Creo que no tengo miedo a la muerte, pero no obstante creo que debe ser un trance uh, durísimo, un trance en el cual estar solo debe ser algo terrible. ¿no? Y los dos judíos y cristianos esperamos que al otro lado del río, al otro lado de la laguna estigia, digamos así, está Dios esperándonos. Pero, pero ¿quién me acompaña en ese tránsito? ¿Quién me acompaña en ese tránsito? Y yo solamente encuentro una respuesta, yo personalmente, y es me acompaña... Jesucristo, el Dios que ha venido, ha cruzado la laguna Estigia para venir a recogerme. Pero me gustaría también saber un poquito su punto de vista sobre este tema. Mu muchísimas gracias, eh, Ravi. So, I think probably these are questions better for your priest than they are for me. Um, but uh, I, you, I, as you can see, no red lines. And no red lines. So, <laughs> so. Um, Let me first of all respond to your questions with, our, with, the, with the words of our sages. So, uh, the question, obviously, the issue, um, 2,000 years ago, precisely with the tragedy that is so central to Jewish historical consciousness with the destruction of the temple and the uh, decimation of the people and the exile, these are obviously questions that were very uppermost in the minds of our sages. And in the Talmud, in Tractate Yoma, they deal with this one particular question. And I won't give you the precise quote, unless you particularly want to, but I'll give you the essence of what, one of their points. And it is a, a fundamental theological. So this is, if you like, a theological, more intellectual, or should I say more cerebral response, which I'm not sure would be satisfying for you, but nevertheless, it's still a very important response. For them, It is precisely God's mercy that allows evil in the world and therefore that allows suffering. Because it is God's mercy that gives human beings free will. And it allows them to be able to make the decisions that they do. And because human beings are human beings uh, and not angels, by definition we make mistakes and sometimes we allow destructive interests to assume control of our decisions. And in this process, there are innocent victims. But it's therefore part precisely of the universe of having given human beings that free will. Now, this relates to your second question, because the rabbis, and indeed one would, could see this already in the prophets and therefore within scripture, cannot 
grasp, cannot perceive that the totality of the moral presence of God can only be seen within that which we encounter in our daily lives in the material world here. And therefore, there must be more to reality than simply that which we see and sense. I would say it is a logical hypothesis too, because there are only one of two hypotheses with nature to the world. <laughs> only two possibilities. One is that it's meaningless, or the other that it's meaningful. In my opinion, to suggest that the world is meaningless and that you and I and our whole history and our whole communities are just an accident requires a leap of faith that is beyond the human capacity to make, at least mine. So the hypothesis that this world is meaningful is a much more compelling one, I'd, I would say objectively, let alone subjectively. But also, a person of faith experiences a reality that there is more to the world than simply that which we see or sense with the material senses. And therefore, that convinces us that the traditional viewpoint, I use now the quote of our sages, that this world is the vestibule before the banqueting hall is a testimony of the reality. This world is a world of value in itself, but it is not all there is to the reality of the divine cosmos and not even the main reality of the whole of the cosmos in itself. And therefore, for Judaism, again, to quote a phrase of our sages, death is but a night between two days. And therefore, the transition, I think, within Jewish tradition is not seen as a traumatic one. It is seen as a natural one, but a natural one that you can face with equanimity and even with joy when you have lived your life in a meaningful way in this world. So the, this is, as I say, a more cerebral answer, but I will give you another answer to your first question with a Hasidic story. There is another passage in the Mishnah, in the, uh, the in the oral tradition that was written down approximately year 200, but of course accumulates the oral tradition for centuries before that, that says you must bless God not only for the good, but also for the evil. And a Hasidic master was teaching this, and his disciples said, How can, what does it mean to bless God for the evil? And he said, go to this town of Anipol, you will find a man called Zusha, and you, he'll explain it to you. So they go off to this village of Anipol, and they meet someone there, and they say, is there a Rabbi Zusha here? They said, no, there's no Rabbi uh, Zusha here. We have only one Zusha. He's a woodmaker, a woodchopper, and he lives uh, just at the edge of the town. They go there. They come to this hovel, a pitiful state, and they see that it's um, barely habitable, in which there are children in rags and, uh, and running around, and they knock on the door, and a man comes to the door, and they say, are you Rabbi Zusha? He says, I'm not a rabbi. I'm a simple wood chopper. And they say, uh, the rabbi, our rabbi told us that if we come to you, you can explain to us the meaning of the Mishnah, where our sages say you must bless God for the evil as well. And he says, I have no idea why the rabbi sent you. I don't understand even what you're saying to me. I don't know anything about evil. God has been good to me all my life. So whether you see, how you see something depends upon where you are coming from, your subjective condition. And if you think that the purpose of life is simply pleasure, and therefore anything that is not pleasure is somehow negative, then you will be disappointed. But the purpose of life is not pleasure. The purpose of life is spiritual growth. Yes, none of us want to suffer, but the challenge is how do you handle the challenges that life presents you with, the pleasurable and the painful? Do you grow through them? Does it bring you closer to God and fellow human beings in greater love, or does it distance for you? 
And that's the best I can do, I'm afraid. And the rest you have to go to your priest for. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias. Eh, yo tenía dos preguntas, una quizás más importante que la otra, pero eh, entonces la, la formulo primero. Eh, tanto cristianos eh, como judíos, creyentes, estamos, eh, tenemos hoy el desafío de vivir en un mundo que, que tiene dos instancias que, que suponen una cierta amenaza para nuestra fe, y no solo para nuestra fe, también para nuestra vida que son, por una parte, el laicismo, el fundamentalismo laicista, y por otra parte, el islam, o el fundamentalismo islámico. Eh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo podemos responder juntos? Porque el diálogo no debe ser solo hablar eh, juntos, o estar hablando los dos, sino debe llevarnos a la acción y a la vida. Entonces, ¿cómo podemos, desde nuestra fe, eh, responder juntos? Históricamente hemos dado dos respuestas, el martirio y la cruzada, pero quizás... Me, eh, el, a la primera nos falta valor y a la segunda quizás eh, ya vemos que, que no es la, la más adecuada. ¿no? Eh, y la segunda es si este diálogo que, que se realiza entre católicos y, y, y judíos se realiza también con otras instancias eh, cristianas, particularmente con, con los ortodoxos, los cristianos de Oriente y, y con los anglicanos y los protestantes. Muchas gracias. So, uh, I think uh, the fir your first question is the most important one, and uh, of course, Father Florencio was addressing this in his closing words. And it's interesting, of course, your reference to martyrdom. Um, um, so, th the supreme goal within Jewish life is the concept of Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying God's name. And sanctifying God's name can mean willing to lay your life down for your faith and for its moral values. But it means, above all, not what you die for, but what you live for. And sanctifying God's name in today's world in particular means affirming the sanctity of life. And we face the denial of the sanctity of life from various sources. There are those who deny that life is anything more than simply a material phenomenon. And therefore, it is our responsibility to jointly witness to the fact that to life's transcendent value in the face of those who would reduce it to its most minimal character. At the same time, there are those who actually abuse religion to pronounce that what God wants is death in his name. And we have to stand together against that kind of perversion of religion that glorifies death. So the most important thing is to witness together for life. There are various ways in which we can witness for life. There can be issues in which we can stand together. There can be projects on which we can work together. There can be understandings that we can disseminate together. But we have, I believe, that shared obligation and responsibility. To witness to life means to witness to God. It means to witness to the transcendent presence in our world. I think this can be broken down in many different ways, but that's the principle. Um, so, The dialogue, the Jewish Christian dialogue, actually did not begin with the Catholic Church. The Protestants were ahead of the Catholics at the beginning. And there are some very obvious reasons why that would be the case. Um, the Church, until the Second Vatican Council, in some ways, might be described as being partially in suspended animation. I think there was an enormous build-up there that when it was facilitated by the Second Vatican Council became a torrent like a great river. And then that spirit totally overtook the others. So that today young people sitting in the Jewish community understandably think that the Jewish-Catholic relationship is the pioneering relationship. 
It's not historically the pioneering relationship, but it is definitely today the most dramatic and the most intense. Both, and the obvi there are some obvious reasons. Uh, the Catholic Church has a magisterium. It has a pontificate. It has a structure where once a new direction is given, it can bring the whole community along with it. Um, no Protestant denomination, not even of the Anglicans, have anything comparable to that. The, um, but nevertheless, there is a very significant dialogue that takes place with the Protestant world, with the Protestant churches. But it is, by definition, diffuse and fragmented and not coordinated. And therefore, it cannot have the impact and the power and the visibility that the Jewish-Catholic relationship has. The, um, then there are other problems with regards to the Protestant world, which I won't go into, but have more to do with politics than it has to do with theology. The, there, of course, is a, another part of Protestantism where, in a way, it is a, the reverse image. And that is a Protestantism with which which is very supportive politically, but nevertheless remains in a theological frame that is still very um, exclusive. And that is coming from the fundamentalist evangelical quarters. Um, they are very often, I often describe them as those who love us to death. Um, now, the Orthodox world, of course, is another world. And what it is, the Eastern churches are lacking the gift of autocritique, of self-criticism, that is to be found within the Western churches. So the Catholic Church is very blessed to have a structure that can preserve it against overt diffusion and superficiality on the one hand, and yet is still part of a healthy Western tradition of critique. And I think this is reflected very much in the writings and the presentations of Emeritus Pope Benedict of the relationship between reason and faith and this dynamic. And I would say that while there are some exceptions in the Orthodox world, uh, personalities like Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew himself, or the Patriarch of Romania, Patriarch Daniel, and others within the churches, Generally speaking, the Eastern churches, for historical, cultural, and political reasons, have not yet embarked upon a serious autocritique. And therefore, the relationship can be good, but is far more superficial. Nos quedan 10 minutos. Lo digo, si alguien quiere hacer una pregunta, que lo piense. Alguien que no haya preguntado, porque usted ha preguntado. No, no. Digo por si... Adelante. Estudios judío cristianos. Una pregunta para cada uno de los dos ponentes. Para el padre Florencio, eh, quería preguntarle si no le he entendido mal, ha afirmado que, lógicamente, nuestro tratado ha cambiado radicalmente la forma de entender las, las relaciones judío cristianas. Pero quería, mi pregunta es, ¿no cree usted que el camino iniciado no solo cambia las relaciones judio cristianas sino que afecta a la teología católica en otros ámbitos, como la soteriología, el tema de la salvación, y que por lo tanto esas relaciones, eh, ese cambio radical de nuestra tate va mucho más allá? Y al rabino David Rosen, mi pregunta es, si no cree usted que el camino iniciado con nuestra tate es para la Iglesia como su particular teshuva. Para la Iglesia. Sí. Por supuesto que no es un cambio solo eclesiológico, ni un cambio de visión diplomática, etcétera, sino un cambio profundamente teológico que lleva especialmente lo soteriológico, o sea, cómo Cristo nos ha salvado. Sí. Entonces, como queda poco tiempo, eso lo digo, por supuesto que va más allá de lo que hemos dicho. 
Sí. <laughs> This is, uh, I use the words cheshbon and nefesh. Cheshbon nefesh is the first component of teshuva. Uh, teshuva, which is not just repentance, but to rehabilitation, is a process in which, first of all, you acknowledge the problem. You address the problem, but then you have to prove yourself. So teshuva is an ongoing challenge. And one can never say in such a complex relationship that teshuva has been completed. So there has been a cheshbon nefesh, and, we, and the church is in this process of teshuva, definitely. Es una pregunta para el, el rabino Rosen. El año pasado tuve la suerte de participar en un encuentro en la Universidad Yeshiva de Nueva York con obispos franceses y algunos obispos españoles. Era uno de esos encuentros anuales que, que empezaron con, uh, se empezaron a hacer desde hace tiempo eh, con el cardenal de... de bueno, sí. Y le preguntamos en esa ocasión, fue hace un año, eh, a los profesores que nos acogieron en el claustro, si el essay, si el essay confrontation de, de Stoyovsky que usted habló antes, si seguía valiendo para ellos. Y David Berger, contestando en nombre de todos, dice que sí, para ellos seguía valiendo ese, ese, ese essay. Es decir, que se puede hablar de todo, pero no de teología y de escatología. Yo me preguntaba, ¿cómo, es, ¿cómo sigue valiendo un essay de 1965? No sé si quiere añadir algo más de lo que usted ha dicho antes. Well, I don't have much to add to what I said before, because I share, as you heard from me, um, a certain, even skepticism and criticism of this particular position. You ask, how is it possible? Um, I think, in a way, a Catholic can understand this better than most people. Bef um, the Catholic, Catholic believers have a pope. I'm not suggesting that Rabbi Soloveitchik was a pope. But for his disciples and for modern orthodoxy in America, which is a particular segment of American Judaism, he is as close to a pope as they will ever have. Now, for a Catholic to criticize a pope is not a simple thing to do, and you would be very loath to do it unless you felt you had to. And that is the mentality on Yeshiva University and of its disciples with regards to Rabbi Soloveitchik. In my opinion, as remarkable as Rabbi Soloveitchik was, it is a big mistake and even a betrayal of Jewish individualism in a positive sense to allow anybody to have within the Jewish community some kind of pontifical authority. This is not the Jewish way. The Jewish way is to look openly and critically at a position and to evaluate it on its merits. And, but for this particular segment of the American Jewish community, anything Rabbi Soloveitchik said is auto, almost automatically sacrosanct. If you take in Europe, for example, if you take uh, like French Jewry, uh, Chief Rabbi Kaplan, or you take British Jewry, uh, Rabbi Hertz, at the period immediately after the war, even before Nostra Aetate, they had no concern about theological engagement and dialogue. And you know what? Even Rabbi Soloveitchik himself did not have a problem. As I indicated in response to the question about red lines, there seems his, his, the article in tradition As much as David Berger, who I love very much and is a wonderful man, as much as he tries to rationalize it, in my opinion, was conditioned by political concerns, internal Jewish political concerns, more than objective theological dialogue. His, his wife, 
uh, the, Mrs. Liechtenstein, still alive, uh, testifies that he himself participated in theological discussions. And um, um, Cardinal Willebrands met with him and spoke about discussions they had had. So I, I, as I say, I'm skeptical about it, and I agree with your critique about it. And, but um, because in American orthodoxy, which is only 10% of American Jewry, American modern orthodoxy, not ultra-orthodoxy, the Hasidic group, but in American modern orthodoxy, he had such a dominant role, so this strange, almost contradictory position still prevails amongst them. Muchas gracias. Eh, me temo que no le puedo dar la palabra porque estamos ya en el límite de la hora. Paula, eh, no sé si... Una, una pregunta. Pa pa Paula, saben que tiene costumbre de poner órdenes para luego violarlas, porque eso es tío natural. Entonces, vamos a ser fieles a Paula y violar la norma que nos ha impuesto. Tiene usted la palabra. Muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, es un hecho que, que para entender bien el cristianismo necesitamos los cristianos eh, acudir al judaísmo para poder profundizar en nuestra fe. Mi pregunta es si hay algo que el mensaje de Jesús de Nazaret aporta al judaísmo. So I think there are, are two aspects to that question. Um, one is the way you phrased it in terms of Jesus and Judaism. The other is maybe to distinguish in some way even though this is obviously artificial, Jesus and Christianity. In other words, you could phrase that as, do, does Judaism have something to learn from Christianity? Or can Christianity be helpful for Judaism? Uh, for the Christian believer, obviously, it's the same question. But maybe for the Jewish uh, respondent, it's not exactly the same question. So part of the tragedy of our history is that what has been a name of love for Christians has been a name of fear for Jews. And even the symbols, let alone the names of Christianity, have been perceived as weapons. So the cross for the Jews has been seen as a weapon used to bash them over the head with and not as a symbol of self-sacrifice. And the name of Jesus has evoked generally fear within Jewish communities over the course of history. This is uh, must, this must be a scandal for Christians from a historical point of view, that the name that should evoke the greatest love has evoked the greatest fear. So, um, nevertheless, as we now emerge into a new era, and as Jews discover Christians as brothers and sisters, and discover that there is genuine love for them, so this is beginning to change, and we have plenty of wonderful Jewish scholarship that looks into the historical Jesus, the context, and very important work that is done in that regard. But it will take time before Jesus is restored to his place within the community of which he was a part and to which he was loyal. This is a process. Nevertheless, if you look in terms of the, what Christianity is, thanks to Jesus, uh, there is room, therefore, to look at this idea that is raised in this document, uh, the gifts of God are irrevocable, in the language of Pope Francis, as the complementarity between Christianity and Judaism. Contributions that one makes. So as you say, it is obvious that Christianity cannot understand itself without understanding its Jewish roots. Judaism does not need Christianity in order to understand its roots. So from that point of view, there is an asymmetrical relationship. But there are messages that each one brings that have a power to be... So Pope Francis uses the term complementarity in terms of the study of scripture. This is also an important complementarity. In other words, the way Christians read scripture can offer Jews insights even if they are not part of their theological world outlook. So to look at texts together, to study together what Nostra Etate calls our shared patrimony is an invitation for learning, for enrichment, for growth. As, uh, and, uh, as Martin Buber said, 
We share a book and a hope. And that is not a small thing. So there is room, therefore, in terms of joint study. But there are other areas in which we may understand the complementarity in terms of the divine economy. So, for example, Judaism at its heart is the concept of a covenantal relationship between community, between people and God. It is therefore a model that revolves around peoplehood, less than it does around the individual, individual relationship with God. It's, I'm not minimizing the value of the individual life, every human being created in the image of God. But the emphasis in Christianity on the personal experience of the divine reality is a different model from the Jewish model that is more revolved around the community experience. In this regard, there is a significant complementarity also in our world. So Christianity perhaps offers a more powerful message for individual alienation in our over-industrialized, mechanized world. Judaism offers a model that is perhaps more suited to a multicultural, multi-ethnic society in which bonds of community have a greater significance and often cannot be adequately appreciated. There are other ways of complementarity. You could say Judaism remains as the document to which Father Florentio referred to of the Pontifical Biblical Commission, which amazingly states that the it is divine meaning and purpose to the Jewish rejection of Jesus. Incredible statement that was signed by Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict. This is his document. In other words, that Christianity benefits from the Jewish response that says our world is not yet redeemed. And yet Judaism perhaps has something to receive from Christianity in a sense that some awareness that redemption is already with us can be perceived even if it's not in the same theological way. So I think both textually and theologically there is room for that exploration of complementarity. But we are only at the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of exploring those possibilities. Muchas gracias. Sinceramente, no quiero ser responsable de que el rabino Rose pierda el avión. El tráfico hoy es horrible y, por lo tanto, tristemente tenemos que eh, poner fin a este seminario, no evidentemente al tema que nos ocupa. Esta universidad, por iniciativa de Padre Florencio, ha creado precisamente el Centro de Isaías II para seguir trabajando de forma cotidiana sobre estos temas que son de enorme interés para todos nosotros. Gracias, Padre Florencio, por su iniciativa, por sus palabras, por su guía de siempre. Eh, Rabbi Rosen, thank you very much for your presence, for your words, for your interest in this university, and we hope to have the opportunity to talk with you in other places, perhaps, perhaps here. In on, Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, always in Jerusalem, of course, on issues of common interest. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.